How's everybody doing today? Awesome, me too. My name is Eric Swanson. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Lakeland. I get to hang out with middle school students and high school students, and um, I'm thrilled to be here this morning to talk with you guys about Breaking Bad. So we've been in the middle of this series Pastor Josh kicked off a couple weeks ago called Breaking Bad, and basically what it's about is diving into a better culture than we naturally experience here on earth. So it's the difference of God's kingdom and his principles and the culture that he brings that we have access to and can live in versus the principles of the culture that we're surrounded by that we naturally kind of drift towards. And so this morning we're talking about how naturally one of the things that we drift towards that our culture says is normal is comparing ourselves to other people. We all do this. We, some of us might struggle to different degrees with this than other people, but it's natural and it's normal for us to look at other people and judge how we are. And we kind of define ourselves and compare ourselves. And God, we're going to see this morning, he gives us a better standard, a better way to live. But it's so natural for us to compare ourselves. This is what we're taught. This is what we're surrounded with. As soon as uh, I was talking to my wife about that, we were talking about this, she said, oh, yeah, that's like you open any magazine or watch any TV show, as soon as like the Grammys or the Emmys are over, they start comparing everybody that walked the red carpet. I don't know if you've seen this. They call it who wore it better, right? You'll see this in magazines and stuff. And basically it'll say, uh, here's a person that wore a dress and somebody else that wore the same dress. Who, and people will vote and we're just taught to compare people. And then we naturally start to compare ourselves to others. So I brought a few of those pictures here. Let me put them up on the screen. Yep, so here's a model wearing a dress. And you can judge who wore it better, the, the dress on the lady or the feather duster. Here's another one, lady in a dress. We found the same dress at a car wash. So we can compare, we can, we can see another one. There's our president. Now he wears his hair a certain way and so, so other people do as well. You guys can judge who wore it better. Yeah, here's the famous face. We found the same face on a cat, so you, maybe that's where you got the idea. Let's see another one. We got a few more of these. This is actually Justin Bieber wearing some saggy pants. So somebody found a, like a diaper that looks the same, put it on, took a picture, and then the world can judge who wore it better, okay? Next one, is, this is a dress that looks like a piece of candy I ate when I was a kid. The next one, this is, a, this is an old picture of Justin Timberlake, and I, I laughed when I saw this because his hair actually looks like ramen noodles in this picture. So. And I think I saved my favorite one for last. The puffy shirt. Any Seinfeld fans in the house? I don't want to be a pirate. So, you know, like 20 years later, it's actually a thing. So um, this is what our culture teaches us. We, we compare everyone. We compare everything, and we compare ourselves to others. And that's normal, and that's natural. But I really believe that God offers us a better standard by which to live by. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. So there's actually tons of advice about not comparing yourself to others, uh, like non-Christian advice. It's not necessarily just a Christian topic. If you Google it, you'll find all kinds of articles, books, blogs about how unhealthy it is emotionally and physically and everything else to compare yourself. Uh, I got a quote from uh, Theodore Roosevelt, actually a wise person, and he says, comparison is the thief of joy. The more that we compare ourselves to other people, the less joy we'll have. Because it's true, you can always find somebody worse than you and be, you know, feel good about that, but you can also always find somebody better than you and feel bad about that, and the more we just live our lives comparing ourselves to other people, it kind of robs us of joy. Um, and I think we've been affected by this forever, but I really believe we're affected by this now more than ever, especially thanks to like smartphones and social media. Now more than ever, we, especially in our American culture, are comparing ourselves to other people's achievements and lives and highlights, and you know, we're looking at posts everywhere, and, and then we just naturally, even without trying to, we start comparing our life with their life, our life with her life, and we compare ourselves to other, and even our, our great old president said, there's no joy in that. There's a better way to live. So, um, you know, we even give, we give better advice to other people than we live by, though. Like, you'll probably give great advice to your kids, even if you don't live by it yourself. So something you would tell your kids, if you have kids, I'm sure you've already said this to them, you know, I just want you to do your best. It's not about how good your sister did versus you or your classmates did. Like, if you get A's, if your best is B's, if your best is C's, I'll be proud of you, right? You've probably, your parents probably told you that or maybe you told your kids that, but we don't naturally live by that ourselves. We, we hold ourselves to a different standard where we start judging other people and judging ourselves based on other people and feeling bad versus saying, hey, am I, how am I doing on my own? How am I doing my best? So, like, we don't get our kids' report cards and, and look at them and, and judge it 
based on how they, other kids in their class did. Well, let me see your neighbor's report card, and then I'll decide if I'm proud of you or not. You know, we don't say, well, this is pretty good, but how did Timmy do? You know, this is good as long as you beat Timmy. Like, that's not what you say to your kids. You say, did you do your best? Then I'm proud of you. But then for ourselves, we compare ourselves to Timmy or whoever it is, and we feel bad about ourselves. Or we compare ourselves to somebody else, and we feel good about ourselves. We get prideful. So, you know, if you're comparing yourself to other people, you either end up being prideful and judgmental, or you end up being depressed and um, none, none of those things are good. So um, here's the real problem, especially when I think spiritually what God would say. Comparing yourself to others ultimately leads to the standard of good enough. This is a, a phrase I kind of made up. The standard of good enough. The way I think about it is the more you compare yourself to others, you'll either say two things. I'm good enough or I'm not good enough. And neither one is really the, a, a healthy mindset. You know, if you, if you compare yourself to others and you think, I'm good enough, it's either this self-pride thing or it's this idea of settling, like, I'm, I'm good enough, you know? That's not, that's not awesome. Or you say, I, I'm not good enough. Or maybe you start to believe, I'll never be good enough because I'll never have as much money as him or I'll never be as pretty as her or I'll never whatever. And you start to feel defeated. You start to feel down. And I believe that God has a better standard for us. So... Uh, the idea is that good enough is not good enough. I was just kind of raised this way. My dad is an extreme perfectionist. He hated the whole term, good enough, right? And so uh, in the house, or even as I got older, I worked for him. He's a builder. And uh, I'd be like, this is crazy. We're taking so long to make this so perfect. Does other people build like this? He's like, well, there's no such thing as good enough. Like, if we can make it better, we'll make it better. Well, if we can make it, you know, as good as possible, we don't want to just settle on being good enough. As a church, one of our values is excellence, that we strive for excellence, and um, we understand that we're not perfect, but as far as what we present to God and our music and our facilities and the programs that we offer, we really do want to do our best. As a church, we don't value good enough. We value excellence. In your family, you don't want to settle for good enough. Good enough kind of implies that it, it could be better, right? If someone says, it's good enough, you instantly think, well, then it's not great, you know? So I, I thought of a couple situations. What if somebody was building your house and you asked about, like, the sturdiness and the integrity and the durability of the foundation. And the builder said, it's good enough. Like, you don't, want, you don't want to build on that foundation. You don't want to live in that house. What if you're paying someone to do your taxes, like a professional? And you say, hey, did you find me the maximum, like, credits and deductions and refund? And the guy says, yeah, that's good enough. I got it done. Sign here. You know, like, no, you don't want your taxes done good enough. You want them done excellently. You want the maximum, okay? What if you sent, like, we're doing trips this summer, we're going on some exciting adventures and we'll probably do rock climbing and things. And what if you sent your teenager on a trip with me and you asked the guide about like uh, the ropes and the harnesses and if they're like in just tip top shape and the guide says, ah, oh, they're good enough. You know, strap it on and get climbing. Like no one's climbing on a harness that the guide says is good enough because good enough implies that it could be better. My favorite one, what if you're teaching your kid how to go to the bathroom on their own? And I've been there. So, and you ask him, hey, did you, did you, did you clean yourself up and all? And he says, ah, eh, good enough. Like, you don't want to do that laundry, okay? Good enough implies that it could be or probably should be better, but this, uh, comparing ourselves to others kind of leads us to this standard of where we either say I'm good enough or we start to think I'm not good enough, and God gives us a better way to live. So I want to compare culture's standard of good enough versus God's standard of holiness, okay? God, God gives us this new standard to judge ourselves and to live in, and it's better than the culture that we're surrounded by. So uh, culture standard celebrates comparison, right? We compare everybody, we compare ourselves, but then we settle for good enough. Because the more I compare, the more I'll just kind of decide what's good enough based on my friends and my family and the people I'm surrounded by or my classmates, and I'll define myself, I'll settle on good enough. God's standard of holiness celebrates holiness. I didn't really have a better word, so you're never supposed to use the same word in a definition, but I kind of did. God's standard celebrates holiness, but it never settles for less. God never settles for less than holy. So God is a holy God, and he lives in a holy place, and he invites perfect people to join him, which is why none of us can get there on our own. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross and raise from the dead so that belief in him, he can make you righteous. He declares you righteous. He calls you holy so that God sees you and he sees his son Jesus having paid for your sins. Through Jesus Christ, we have the power to live a holy life. And we have our ticket punched, in a sense, to heaven, okay? But he never settles for less. Uh, actually, there's a pastor that wrote a book 
called How Good is Good Enough because our culture really does think a lot of people would believe if you're good enough, if you do enough good, then you can get to heaven. And well, who are you to decide how good is good enough? That's kind of the premise of the book, and it's, it's a really kind of a bright thought. So our culture settles on good enough. God doesn't settle for less. So we have to celebrate the fact that through Jesus, he can make us holy. But what I want to really look in today is three passages of Scripture. I think we see all through Scripture this standard of God's holiness. We see that God is a holy God. He's God, so he gets to set the standard. He is the standard. He is holy. We see this all through Scripture. The first passage I want to look at is 1 Peter. So if you're opening up your Bible, way back in the New Testament, the book of 1 Peter. Peter, if you want to grab one of these ones under your seat, I'll tell you what page it's on. It's on page 1200, 1200. And if you're really lazy, I'll put it on the screen for you, okay? But the book of 1 Peter is written by Peter. He's one of the leaders of the early church. He's one of the leaders of all the apostles. And he's writing to a group of believers, people who have accepted Christ but then they still need to continue growing in that relationship. And it's interesting, the way he speaks to them, it sounds almost like he's speaking to us. And the challenge he gives them is appropriate for us as well. So 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to start in verse 14. Peter says this, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Okay. Now it's interesting, he says children. So these are, he's writing to Christians. He's writing to people who believe and have accepted Jesus. But then he says, do not conform. So he's saying, as Christians, you should be different than the people who don't have crowd. You should be different than, you should live with a, a different mindset and different principles of a different culture, a kingdom culture, and not what you're surrounded with. But he knows that naturally what we do is we start to conform. We start to fit in. We start to think and live and talk and act like the people around us. It's just natural. 2,000 years ago, people had the same struggle that they would start to conform. So he's like, listen, I know you've been saved. You've got to like, continue to work at it to not conform to the way that you used to live in ignorance. Before you knew Jesus, that's just who you were. But with Jesus, you have the ability and the power to live differently. And then he goes on, verse 15. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now, here he's quoting a passage from the Old Testament. Where he's saying it's not just an Old Testament thing, but all through eternity, God is a holy God, and he's calling a holy people to follow him. And he sets the standard of holiness, that only through Jesus can you become holy, and then a life lived to God is this idea of living a life of holiness. He says, be holy, because I who call you am holy. And he goes on in verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. This is really neat. Three things I see in that verse. First, it says, he judges each person's work impartially, which is a little scary. It's a little sobering that God looks at your life and your actions and your thoughts and your attitudes, and he's going to deal with your, your, your body of work when you face him one day. That's a little nerve-wracking. I'm going to have to face up to God for all the things I've done and thought and said. Um, but what's really cool is it says he judges each person's work impartially. So he doesn't judge on a bell curve. He's not looking at you and your neighbor at the same time and comparing who wore it better. He's not judging you according to how someone else lived or talked. He's not going to say, well, you did better than that person. And he's not going to say, well, you didn't do as good as this person. He judges your work impartially. So all you've got to do is think about your own life and follow God as much as you can without comparing. God doesn't compare you to other people. So you shouldn't compare you to other people. But he calls us to be holy, okay? I guess what I take from this is, God doesn't want you to be good enough. He wants you to be holy. God doesn't want you to be good enough. Our culture settles for good enough. We're taught to compare yourself, find your place, and settle on good enough. And God says, I've got better plans for you. I've got a better standard for you. My standard is holiness, and I want you to be holy. I sent Jesus so that you could become holy, and I've given you my spirit so you could live holy lives unto me. You know, the idea of holy, the term really means set apart. The, the fact that you're set apart from sin, you're separated from sin, but that you're set apart to God or for God, for God's purposes. In a really silly way, I think of it like when I see my kids eat their lunch, they'll take like their favorite thing and they'll, they'll set it to the side of their plate or sometimes they'll set it off the plate and make a mess on the table. But they're setting apart because it's special and they'll eat it last, right? You probably, maybe you still do this or you did this when you were a kid. But the idea that it's set apart because it's special and it's set apart for a reason. And that's the same that we are called to be holy. And this is what God's calling us to. 
But another way to think about it is this. Jesus didn't die to make you good enough. He died to make you holy. God sent his son to pay for your sins, not so that you could live a good enough life the rest of the way out, but so that you would live a holy life. And now this almost makes me laugh because it sounds like a big guilt trip. I, I thought of this because I've got a couple friends, uh, <laughs> a couple buddies of mine used to always, like if you made any excuse, they would take it to the Jesus level, right? Like, hey, did you get that done? Well, I was really tired, so I didn't do it last night. Well, aren't you glad Jesus wasn't too tired to do what he came to do? You're like, and they would have this extreme guilt trip, these two guys, every time they would take any excuse to the Jesus level, like why I didn't or how I didn't or whatever it was, and they would Jesus you right there. So I'm not trying to make you feel guilty, but the truth is God sent his son so that you could be holy because that's his standard, so that you would become saved by him and seen as holy through him, but then live a holy life. Peter says this as a command, not a suggestion. We are called to live holy Lives. I want to look at the verse right before that. We started in verse 14, but Peter really shows us that um, we've got a part to play in this. Yes, through Jesus, we can, we can celebrate what Jesus did for us, what he's accomplished to us, and the fact that only he can make us holy. And only through him do we have the power to live a holy life, but it's still on us. Look at verse 13. Prepare your minds for action and exercise Self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. The, verse, the very first part, he says, prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. This idea that you've got a part to play in this as well. You can't do it apart from Jesus, but you still have a part to play. In the original, like in the first century when Peter's writing this, the idea that the reader was to get from this was literally, you know, they didn't have skinny jeans back then. So the idea was to literally gather up like your long flowing garments and be prepared for physical action. The idea is that you've got a part to play in this pursuit of holiness, that you would physically, mentally, spiritually pursue holiness, and it's actually on you to fight the fight as well. So God, God's kingdom brings a better culture, not good enough, but holy. So the question is, how do we do that? And I want to show a really interesting passage of scripture in, verse, in, in Isaiah. So if you want to flip backwards to the book of Isaiah, it's towards the middle of your Bible. And um, but how, how do we pursue holiness? I believe starts with catching a glimpse of God's holiness. For us to pursue holiness in our own life starts with us getting a glimpse of God's holiness. So I want to read something real interesting in Isaiah chapter 6. And there's a title, you know, over the passage that says Isaiah's Commission, which is true. It's like where Isaiah is called by God to be a prophet. But I think more importantly in this passage is the glimpse of God's holiness and how it changes us. So uh, Isaiah chapter 6, start verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Okay, so Isaiah is given in a vision, or a dream basically, uh, a picture of God. And he sees God high and exalted, sitting on a throne, reigning as king. Above him were seraphim. Now, these are like creatures that we don't have on earth. He, probably, he maybe made up this word at the time. We see this pop up in other places in scripture, but it literally would mean burning ones. These are incredible flaming creatures that had to be super scary to him, okay? Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they're surrounding God's throne as if to glorify God and protect God and praise him all at the same time. And even they are covering their faces in his presence, and they were calling to one another, verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the sound of their voice, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So these amazing, burning, heavenly creatures, frightening creatures, they just constantly declare God's holiness. And at the sound of their voice, the building shakes, and the room is filled with smoke, and Isaiah is terrified because he gets a glimpse of the magnitude of God's holiness. And look how he responds in verse 5. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. When he sees God's holiness, he sees his own blemishes, unholiness, imperfection. The light of God shows us who we really are. If we want to feel better about ourselves, we compare people who are behind us in the race. But if we want to get a glimpse of who we really are, we see God's holiness. And he says, I'm, I'm wrecked by this. 
I can't face up to you. Plus, he knows the scriptures that say, um, you cannot see God and live, right? There's a passage where Moses says, God, I want to see your glory. And God says, you can't see me in my glory. You'll die. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll cover your face and I'll pass in front of you and then you can see my back as I leave. And he does that and Moses goes down off the mountain and people are scared of him because he's literally glowing. He's radiating so that he has to wear a veil, okay? And Isaiah knows these scriptures that say, you can't see God's face and live. And he's like, God, you've given me a vision. I've seen you high and exalted praise and I got a glimpse of your holiness. Now, because of my unholiness and your great holiness, I'm gonna surely die. And he's terrified of God. Let's keep reading. Verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth. And he said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And this is really cool. Verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go with us? And I said, here I am. Send me. We see a pattern in this passage where all through Scripture, when God shows up or an angel of the Lord shows up, uh, Old Testament and New Testament, initially the reaction is fear. You know, an angel shows up to, to Mary and she's, a, and she's terrified. And, and all through the Scriptures, we see when, we, when someone comes face to face with God or an angel of God, they're terrified because when we get a glimpse of God's holiness like Isaiah, it wrecks us. And we, we humbly bow and we glorify God and it causes this appropriate fear and worship all at the same time. But then it leads to obedience that all through scripture, these people that are terrified and then the angel usually says something like, fear not or be not afraid. And then they tell them what I want you to do or where I want you to go. And the person says, I'm in and I'll do it. And right here, he goes from this moment of fear and worship. And then God says, well, who shall I send? He's like, oh, send me. I can't wait to obey now that I've seen your holiness. And if we want to pursue holiness in our life, it starts with first getting a glimpse of the magnitude of God's holiness that causes us appropriate fear and worship and leads to obedience. Every time in Scripture, that's what happens when people meet God. And when you meet God, it should cause worship that leads to obedience. If we get a glimpse of God's magnitude, the, whole, the magnitude of his holiness, it should cause obedience and help us want to pursue holiness in our life. I laugh at this story. My dad, I told you, he's a builder. So they had built a house and painted it and all. And uh, two years later, he gets a call from this customer. And he said, you guys got to repaint my whole living room. It's, you did a lousy job. And my dad's like, I'm, I'm surprised, you know. And he's like, two years ago, but let's go look. And so they go, and he's like, it looks great still. And the guy's like, well, hold on. He's got like this vaulted ceiling, you know, and, and uh, it, all, everything looks good. And so the guy takes one of these. You, you ever seen those like handheld, like humongous spotlights? They're measured in like millions of candle watt power or something like that. I don't know how they're, and uh, he takes it and he shines it at you know, like a laser beam, and he's like looking around the ceiling with this incredibly bright light, and he finds like the spot. And he's like, there it is. Look at that. You need to repaint the whole room. And my dad's like, well, first of all, it's been two years. Secondly, who's walking in your house with a spotlight to find that blemish, you know? Like, and I don't remember, I, I, I think he actually like appeased the guy and patched it up, or I don't remember what he did, but the idea is a bright enough light will start to show imperfections. And that's what happens when we meet Jesus and when we get a glimpse of God's holiness. It shows our blemishes and our imperfections. But God sends Jesus just like that seraphim flies to Isaiah and he says, your guilt is taken away. Your sins have been atoned for. And through Jesus, you can live a holy life set apart to God, set apart from sin. That should be our response. I want to look at one more passage in the book of Philippians. Um, so if you want to flip back to the New Testament, Philippians chapter 2. This is a really interesting passage where I see two things that seem like they can't be both true, but they are true. And, and Paul is writing to a church, and he's telling them the, the dynamic, the balance of the fact that God alone can make us holy, but we have to work at it. That it's on us to do it, but we can't do it without God, right? You have no power over sin. You cannot be holy without the power of Christ in your life. But it's not like you just sit around and say, okay, well, over time, God will make me holy. No, Paul teaches very clearly that there's something that we have to do. We play a role in this. So I just love this passage. Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. So this is kind of like what I would say to my kids when we get a babysitter. Like Paul went around and started churches. And so, 
you know, as he's there, he's teaching them how to follow God and teaching them how to worship and all the things that he's teaching them. And then he, like, he's a missionary, so he leaves and he writes them these letters to like, continue to teach them. He's like, when I leave, you better be even more obedient. You know? And so anyways, it just reminds me of talking to my kids and threatening them when the babysitter comes over. But not only my presence, but now much more in my absence. Look what he says. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Two things I want to point out. First, he says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This idea that you do have a role to play. It's on you to pursue holiness, to work at it, that it might not be easy. He says work out. It sounds like I'm going to the weight room, right? That I'm doing reps, that I'm working out to grow my muscles and really to grow your spiritual muscles, that you have work to do to pursue holiness. But don't get the idea that you can do it on your own. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot make yourself good enough. You cannot make yourself holy. But you do have a role to play. I don't know the balance. I don't know if it's 50-50, like I'll do my half, God will do his half. I got an idea it's more like 90-10 or maybe 99-1, like God's doing 99% of it, but I, got, I don't know what the balance is. God doesn't tell us the percentage. All I know is God never fails to do his part. And then he promises to help us with our part. Isn't that awesome? Like God is faithful and will never fail to do all that he can for us. And then, although we fail and are unfaithful, he stays faithful and helps us and gives us grace to do our part. But we certainly do have a part. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But then the next verse, he says, but it's God who works in you to will and to act. To will and to act. To want to do it and to actually do it. To will and to act. God gives you this through Jesus. He gives you the desire to follow him. He gives you the ability to have, you know, power over sin and temptation and live a victorious, holy life. And we are not perfect, and we will not be perfect until we get to heaven. But he will forgive us every time when we confess our sins. But until then, he says, work at it. Keep trying. Strive for it. Pursue holiness in your life. And it's work. You do have a role to play. But you can't do it on your own. It's actually God who does the work. But you got to work at it. But God's the one. Like, I don't know. It's an interesting dynamic. But it's incredible that my mind would make more sense of the fact that he says, hey, now that I've forgiven you for your sins, do as best you can. Go for it. It's on you. At least it'd be like, I see clearly what it is. Or if he said, hey, I've forgiven you for your sins, and over time I would just make you holy and change you and just sit back because it's me who does it. But instead, both are true. You have to work at it, but you can't do it without me. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But connected to me, you can bear much fruit. Bearing fruit involves us working with God, but not doing it apart from God. Then he goes on in verse 14 and 15. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. Do you ever feel like we live in a warped and crooked generation? Feels like that more than ever. Probably will feel that way even more so 10 years from now. But Paul wrote this to a group of believers almost 2,000 years ago. And even they knew that they lived in a warped and crooked generation and they needed to break bad. They needed to break away from the principles of the culture that they lived in and live by the principles of a better standard, holiness. But look, he says the reason why, one of the reasons we should pursue holiness is that in, since we live in a crooked and warped generation, as we pursue holiness, then you will shine among them like stars. The idea is that God's plan is that as we pursue holiness, holiness in our lives, people will then get a glimpse of God's holiness. Not because we're perfect, but as we pursue holiness, as we work out our salvation, then people will see God, that we will stick out because we live in a warped and a crooked generation, that people would notice that we're different, and they would see our lifestyle, that we pursue holiness, and through that, they would get a glimpse. And so I just see this cycle that goes on and on, that as we get a glimpse of God's holiness, it wrecks us, calls us to obedience, that we pursue his holiness. And that as we pursue his holiness, other people get a glimpse of God's holiness. And they're appropriately wrecked in worshiping God that they leads to obedience. And the cycle continues. And that's God's plan to use his people to live holy lives so that other people see who he is and that they would come to follow him as well. That's what God's called us to. I really believe that it's God who works in us to will and to act, to want to follow him and to be able to do it. But if you're not convinced, I'm sure some of you are like, yeah, I already, I want this. That's my goal as well. If you're not convinced, I just thought of a couple reasons. One, the reason we should pursue holiness is just what Paul said. That's how people will see God. 
People will see God's holiness and follow him as we do that in this weird, crooked generation that we live in. But also it honors God and God honors people who pursue holiness. It's like he blesses your efforts, right? Like if I actually eat better and work out, I will get stronger. And when I work out my salvation, God will bless my efforts. And then third is, I believe that you'll experience the greatest joy in your life as you pursue holiness in every area of your life. That there wouldn't be an area untouched by our pursuit of holiness. That we would never settle for being good enough. That we wouldn't just compare ourselves to others and think, well, I'm doing better than she is. But that in every area of our life, we would pursue God's holiness. And as we do, you'll experience more and more joy. Even like Theodore Roosevelt said, there's no joy in comparison. It's actually the thief of joy. We know that. That's why we should pursue God's holiness in every area of our life. I just want to close with a, a quick story of, uh, I got four kids. Uh, one's young, so he's off the hook. The other three are old enough to fight and stuff like that and get in trouble. So I'm always having to like talk to them, give them timeouts or whatever. And uh, it never fails with any of them. As soon as, you know, one of them gets in trouble and I'm like, all right, we, we got to sit down and talk. The only thing they actually are thinking about the whole time is the other person they were arguing with. And, and they'll say, well, what about her? She said it too. He did it too. Is he going to get in trouble? Does he have to have a timeout? And I'm always like, stop worrying about them and worry about yourself. Like, whether they were right or wrong doesn't matter if you were wrong. Stop comparing yourself. Stop worrying about them. And then I'll say, you know what? I'm her daddy too. And I will have a conversation with her as well. You don't need to worry about her. How she acted doesn't matter about how you act. And, but our kids do this, and I can just imagine God having the same conversation with us, that when he looks at us and Peter says, he judges our works impartially. Naturally, we compare ourselves, and we'll say, yeah, but what about them? But she did it too. And he's like, hey, hey, hey I'm, I'm a big enough God. I'm her daddy too. I'm their daddy too. And I will talk with them as well. But you need to worry about you. This is what I tell my kids all the time. You need to worry about you. I say it like a broken record. And I feel like that's the same thing God would say to us. Pursue my holiness. Don't compare yourselves to others. Maybe you've been at it for a long time. Maybe you've been at it for a short time. Maybe you feel like you've grown a lot. I don't know where you feel like you're on in this journey with God, but until he takes you home, you're called to pursue holiness. A um, professor of mine talked about this idea of salvation, and he said, the best definition I have of, of what it means, what salvation means is salvation is already, but not yet, right? I'm already saved in a sense that when I put my faith in Jesus, he forgives me for my sins. And if you want to say my ticket is punched to heaven, like he will not take that from me when I truly believe. But I'm not yet saved because someday I'll be glorified in heaven and I'll have a perfect mind and a glorified body and a perfect place and I won't struggle anymore. Until then, what, we're in between. And, the, and when you read the New Testament, you'll see the word salvation and it's sometimes referring to one or the other, but it's this idea that I'm already saved. I'm justified by Jesus in my sins. And now, in the meantime, I am being sanctified, growing closer to God, pursuing holiness, and one day, God will take me home and I'll be glorified. Salvation is this idea of already, but not yet. And in the meantime, he's calling us to pursue holiness in every area of our life, to not settle for good enough, to not compare ourselves with anybody else. God sets the standard. My question is, how are you doing in your pursuit of holiness? And I don't say that to guilt trip you or make you feel bad about yourself or think of some super Christian that you're sitting next to, but just honestly, that our hearts would say, God, my prayer has been, God, give us a glimpse of your holiness so that we will be appropriately wrecked and then obedient to pursue holiness. And please use us that as we pursue you, others will see you through us. That's my prayer for us. That's my challenge for you today. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. And I thank you for the principles of your kingdom that we have access to celebrate and embrace, even on this earth. I pray, as Peter prayed, that we would not conform to the world around us, but that we would live a different life for your glory. You've set the standard of holiness. Thank you for Jesus, that through him we can be made holy and righteous, forgiven for our sins. Thank you that through the power of the cross and your spirit, we can live holy lives unto you. I pray that you would challenge us with that thought. I pray that you'd show us any area of our life that we need to give to you and pursue holiness in. I pray that we will experience the greatest joy as we do that. I pray that as we do that as a church, as a body, that people would be drawn to you as we pursue holiness. God, help us not to compare ourselves to others. Help us not to settle for good enough, but help us to be holy as you are holy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
on your way out. If you want to sign up for the Belfry, you can do that, and we'll see you guys next week.